So, you want to get into The Division 2? Here's absolutely everything you need to know as you start out on your journey. Hey everyone, Rogue Gold here, and today I felt like this was an ideal time to put together a comprehensive new player guide for the game. With the recent re-release on Steam, I know there's been a lot of sales going on, I've seen a huge influx of new faces to the community lately, so if you are new then welcome to the game. I've been covering this franchise for a couple of years now, and been playing since the day the first game released back in 2016, and it's always a joy for me to be able to help anybody out on their journey into The Division. If you like the game and are considering sticking around, I cover all things Division, including news, breakdowns, guides, and more, so please consider clicking that subscribe button, it truly helps out. And nearly 80% of y'all who watch my content aren't subscribed, so what are you waiting for? You know you want to. Today, we're going to be going over practically everything you need to know about The Division 2 as a new player, what version to buy, the leveling experience, the end game. It's going to be a long one, so sit back, grab some popcorn. There will be timestamps below that you can use to skip to whatever sections may be most relevant to you. And throughout the video, there will be a few times where I reference additional external videos that you all can use to gain extra information and knowledge if you so want it. So so just know that all of those will be linked in the description below. The first one being a video I did covering some must-know settings to change within the game, as that's something I do not cover in this guide. With all of that said, feel free to ask any questions you may have down in the comments below, and let's jump in. Starting with, what do I need to purchase? I frequently get asked by players interested in trying The Division 2 out, what version do they actually need? Do I need this pass or that pass? Do I need certain DLC? So let's break it all down. All that you need to own in order to have access to all of the main content for the game is the base version of The Division 2 and its one and only expansion, Warlords of New York. Whether that means you buy them separately in a bundle, doesn't matter. If you just buy the main game and not Warlords, then you can still play the main campaign and reach the level 30 endgame. The only drawback is that while the game to this day receives free content updates, it's only free and available to owners of Warlord. So without it, you're going to be stuck at the level 30 endgame, which has very few, if any, people playing it, and it's essentially not supported or updated by the development team. So whether you do it off the bat or once you reach level 30, you're going to want to get Warlords, and that will give you access to the vast amount of endgame content The Division 2 has to offer. As for any other additional DLCs or packs, I get asked about the Year 1 pass a lot. Without going into too much detail, the only benefits you get from owning that pack these days is an instant unlock and bypassing of the progression process for three of the game's six specializations, which are basically endgame classes, as well as access to the game's eight classified assignments. Now, these are technically exclusive content. However, the missions are relatively short. They don't offer competitive rewards and ultimately just aren't that necessary. So totally up to you, but just know that the year one pass is not required in any way. Any other DLCs or season passes you might see in the store, don't worry about those until the end game. Just the base game and Warlords of New York is all you're going to need. Let's now move on to the beginning of your Division 2 journey, what do you need to know when it comes to the campaign and leveling process for the game? Well, to be quite honest with you, I don't think you need to know very much. Could you speedrun things a certain way and min-max low-level gear to be the most efficient and do all that crazy stuff? Sure, but if your goal is to actually enjoy the game and learn about the game and, you know, actually just play the game, then I strongly encourage you all just to take it at your own pace and learn as you go. The game provides ample tutorials to explain basic mechanics and features as much as you'll need to know, and from there, just experience a explore and enjoy. The game pretty clearly guides you through the campaign and continues to tell you what to do next, so yeah, just go in there and get to level 30 at your own pace. Upon purchasing Warlords, the game does offer you a level 30 boost to skip the main campaign and jump straight into the expansion content, which you certainly can do, but my recommendation, if this is your very first time playing, is to go through that organic 1-30 to experience and get an understanding for the game for yourself before diving off the deep end. The one thing I did want to do in this section is lay out the exact order of missions to complete for chronological story order because it can get a bit murky at a certain point, so feel free to reference back to this as you're going through the process. The first main mission in the game is Grand Washington Hotel, and the game will take you to that very clearly. It will then guide you all the way up until the final mission of the main campaign, Capitol Building. From there, you're going to want to do World Tiers 1 through 5, playing the invaded versions of these missions and finishing off with Tidal Basin, an invaded exclusive mission. After that, you can visit the helicopter pilot at the base of operations. From there, Camp White Oak and Manning National Zoo should be your first two stops, followed by the two missions at the Pentagon and ending with the two missions at Coney Island. After that, you can finally feel ready to safely head into Warlords of New York. The last tip I'll offer for the leveling experience is don't overstress about gear hoarding or min-maxing builds or anything like that. 
Obviously, you can and should mess around with the different systems to get a feel for things, but just know that all the way until you reach level 40 and hit the end game, you're going to continually get better items with higher stats, so don't worry about having the most optimal synergies or saving tons of stuff. You don't need to. Speaking of the end game, let's talk about it. You've beat Warlords, you hit level 30, what the hell do you do now? Well, kind of whatever you want. What's unique about Division 2 compared to some other similar games in the genre, such as Destiny, is that there isn't much vertical progression. By that I mean, there isn't a gear score or a power level you need to reach to play different content from the moment you hit level 40 pretty much everything is open to you. You might not be experienced enough to take it on, and you might not have the right gear to tackle the challenge, but if you see something on the map and you want to say, I want to go try that out, you can. But let's start out with some of the important content-based endgame features. The first is a very important one that becomes available at the endgame that you should absolutely be aware of, and that is open-world difficulty tuning. If you open your mega map, you'll see a button prompt at the bottom, which allows you to open global settings. Press that, and surprise, you now have new ways to customize the game's difficulty to your liking. You can set the open world anywhere from normal to heroic. This affects anything that's not in a mission area, changing NPC health, damage and overall lethality, as well as increases the XP and quality of loot you will receive for the content you play. So to start off, you're probably going to feel most comfortable around the normal or hard range, but once you earn some better gear, get more equipped, try out challenging and heroic, see how they feel. Additionally, this menu allows you to apply directives to the open world. These are essentially modifiers, adding additional layers of challenge to further increase the XP rewards you gain from activities. And lastly, you have the option to reset all control points on the map. This means that whenever you go and clear an open world control point, it will stay friendly until you manually reset it. So if you want a primarily non-hostile world, you can do that, or you can reset them after every single run. Your choice. Another hugely important endgame feature is targeted loot. Now, as you likely know, The Division 2 is an RPG game with build-making mechanics. We're going to cover builds shortly, but what that means is that you're going to be collecting lots and lots of loot during your Division 2 journey, all to create different kinds of builds and playstyles. And so, let's say you want to go after something in particular. How do you do that? Well, in comes targeted loot. If you go to your mega map once again, you'll see another button prompt that says show targeted loot. And what this does is suddenly reveals an array of different symbols and icons. Now, it's going to take you a little while to learn exactly what everything is and what the symbols correlate to and what type of gear, but all you need to know is that every facet of the endgame ties into targeted loot, which is a system that's on a daily rotation, and what it does is make certain gear items more likely to drop in certain areas. So maybe one day, Assault Rifles is tied to the Lincoln Memorial main mission, and then the next day, it's tied to the Federal Triangle open world zone. This does not mean that you can't earn Assault Rifles elsewhere in the game, you certainly still can, but it means that if you're specifically looking for a particular Assault Rifle, if you want the best chances of finding it, you should play the content or zone that has the associated target, because you're going to be getting a higher frequency of loot drops in that category. So it's a really nice feature, one that every kind of Division 2 player really takes advantage of, and targeted loot spans the entire endgame, being present in open world content, missions, the dark zone, game modes. We'll cover a lot of that shortly, but just know that as you're on your quest to make different types of builds and earn gear, targeted loot is your best friend. Let's now move on to a few new pieces of content you may have seen pop on your map compared to when you were going through the campaign. Assuming you played the campaign through linearly and didn't skip to Warlords, you should have a good grasp on what invasions are. Those are the red icon missions on your map. They rotate in every week with three main missions, one Stronghold and Tidal Basin, and completing them each week will grant you extra rewards and useful endgame materials. Another feature of the endgame is game modes. This is a big hallmark of the Division franchise. These are typically more replayable types of content and tend to offer some of the highest quantities of loot for your time. Two of them also offer the option for you to select your own targeted loot, so they're understandably very popular pieces of content. The Division 2 currently has three available game modes. You can access these from the helicopter pilot at the base, but you'll also find them in the upper right corner of your mega map. The first is Kenley College, and while I wish I could say this is a fun mode, it's not. It has a strange lockout rotation rotation, meaning you can't play it for weeks at a time. The replayability factor just isn't there, it's mostly puzzle-based more than anything, and the rewards for it aren't spectacular either. So if you're bored, feel free to run it through once just for the experience and to get that exclusive exotic reward it has. Other than that, I wouldn't waste your time there. Next is the Summit. This one is more interesting, it allows you to pick your own targeted loot and features a wide amount of difficulty customization. It's also a bit more solo and casual friendly than the rest. And then lastly, we have Countdown. This is the most recent game mode the game received just last year in Season 9, and it's by far the game's most popular and lucrative farming spot. 
It's an eight player match made mode, though you can play solo on lower difficulties, and it runs in quick 15 minute sessions where you rack up tons of action and tons of loot. It also allows you to select your own targeted loot, further increasing the viability of the mode, and by nature of it being match made, you can lean on your teammates a bit for support. I highly recommend Countdown for any new endgame player who's wanting to get their foot in the door and start putting some builds together, and the hard difficulty is likely a good place for you to start at. And then, lastly, I have to mention raids. These are easily the Division 2's most prestige and exclusive endgame content as they are 8-player tuned activities, and at least the normal version of them does not offer matchmaking. So, as a new player, don't worry about trying to jump into raids. They are really fun experiences and have some high-tier loot with exclusive exotic rewards. But take your time and play the game for a while first, and once you earn some power, make some friends, then you'll be more equipped to try them out. And when you are, you'll find them both on the left side of your mega map. That covers the majority of the notable content features to point out with the endgame. Now I want to shift focus to the numerous progression systems and the underlying features the Division 2 offers that you absolutely are going to need to be aware of if you want to effectively and properly continue to earn power and level up once you reach the endgame. The first is build making. Now I'm sure you've learned plenty about this as you went through the campaign, but earning, equipping, and tuning gear to your preferences to create synergies is the Division 2's primary progression path. This comprises of two primary weapons and a sidearm, six gear slots, two skill slots, and a specialization. Similar to what I said about the leveling experience earlier on, you're really just going to have to get a feel for it all yourself. I'm sure by now you know that every item comes with different stats and attributes and bonuses. Here's what you need to know about it for the end game: Gold, high-end items, teal gear, set items and red exotic items are the only three types of gear you're going to need to worry about in the end game. Everything else is lesser in power and these three are equal in statistical power, meaning using any combination of them is what will allow you to have an end game viable build. Of course there are certain brand sets and talent combinations and all of that that will make your builds much more powerful, but those three categories is all you should really be caring about once you hit the end game. I recently made a video highlighting my top five recommended builds for the Division 2 in 2023, I will leave a link for that below, so in case you need some inspiration or an idea of where to start as far as build making goes, feel free to use that as a resource. Moving on, let's talk about the first major endgame progression system to be aware of, and that is specializations. I believe you get access to these at level 30, so if you've played Warlords, you likely have some familiarity with them. You can access the station to view them right inside the front door of the base of operations, and these essentially act as endgame classes. However, they're hardly that rigid. More than anything, they can enhance certain builds and styles of play, and they offer access to unique skills mods and pistols, and of course the signature weapon. By default you should have access to the survivalist, sharpshooter, and demolitionist. The other three, the technician, gunner, and firewall were added post-launch and require additional steps in order to unlock. That's the perk I was mentioning about the year one pass. If you own that then you get to skip that unlock process. If not then at the bottom of the window you'll see a view field research button. Hit that and you'll see the various stages and challenges needed to unlock the spec. And don't forget that you can inspect each specialization to see their associated skill trees. There is isn't really a best one. As I said, they all kind of work towards different builds and playstyles, so I suggest browsing through each and deciding which one sounds most interesting for you to start with. In order to earn points to spend in that skill tree, you'll need to have the spec equipped as you go out and play content, and I know one effective way to earn points is by running those invaded missions we covered a bit earlier on. Next up, also super important, and that's the system you unlock right at the climax of Warlord's campaign, your SHD watch. This is the one you're going to find in the bottom right corner of your inventory, and while it's pretty self-explanatory, it is vital to continuing your power gain after reaching level 40. Every level that you earn post level 40 is displayed in the top right corner of your screen and this is known as your SHD level and for every level you earn you simultaneously earn one point to spend in your SHD watch. There are four categories of bonuses, damage, survivability, skills and miscellaneous, plus a fifth scavenging selection, and they contain different individual stats like crit chance, explosive resistance, skill haste, etc. And from SHD levels 1 to 1000, you will continue to earn incremental upgrades to your power in the form of these stats. By the time you're done, you'll have the likes of 10% extra weapon damage, 10% extra armor, and much more. So it's absolutely worth your time to remember to check in on and spend your points and is a great starting goal once you reach the end game is to start leveling that up. Next up, I want to cover the various different features and progression systems that are housed at your crafting and recalibration benches. These benches are always nearby each other and can most easily be accessed at your base of operations in DC, both inside the White House and underneath the helicopter pilot, as well as in New York's Haven settlement. Now, what these two benches 
switches allow you to do is to craft, tune, augment, and do so much more to your earned gear that can truly allow you to go to the next level of endgame power. So I'm going to go over them one by one. The first is recalibration. This system allows you to completely change one attribute on any piece of equipment you own except for exotics. Everything else, let's say you get a high-end piece that has literally two out of the three rolls that you want. No problem. Recalibration will let you correct that one roll and make it the one that you want. In order to do that, however, you're going to need to build up your recalibration library, a tab that can also be found here on the same bench. The basic idea is you're building up a collection, a library of stats, talents, and attributes that you can then use an infinite number of times to put onto other pieces of gear. Meaning, let's say you enter a 15% weapon damage value for masks into the library, you'll always have the option to place that 15% stat onto a new piece of gear that you acquire. But you have to submit it first, which is why it's such an important thing for new players to be aware of. The way you build up your library is by donating pieces of gear that have the stat that you want. In other words, you're going to need to extract the stats that you want saved. So let's say I have a chess piece with weapon damage that I want to save. I'm going to enter my recalibration library, go to chess pieces, find the one that I want to donate, and you can then select that specific role to extract and save to your library. In the process, this does permanently destroy the item you extracted the stat from, so it's important to carefully pick out which ones you want to use for donation, but it's that simple. Once you enter a stat into the library, you can then put it onto any piece of gear you like for the rest of time. You'll just need to obtain the proper resources, go into recalibration, and voila. Two important things to note here. One, keep in mind that you have to save stats for each kind of roll for every gear slot. So you can't just enter one weapon damage roll and be covered for every item. You'll need a mask damage roll, a holster damage roll, etc. And and secondly, there is a recalibration library available for both level 30 and level 40 players. So again, it's up to you if you get Warlords or not. Just be aware that progress does not carry over between the two. So if you plan to move on to the level 40 endgame, don't waste your time or resources building up your level 30 library because it won't be there when you get to 40. All right, next up we come to crafting. This one should be pretty self-explanatory, shouldn't be too crazy, but the Division 2 does allow you to craft a wide variety of things from gear itself to weapons, mods, certain exotics, etc. Just go to the crafting bench at the base and see what blueprints you've got. This is less of a how-to section and more of just a don't forget this exists type of shout out because it's not revolutionary. You just collect blueprints, get the proper resources you need, and hit craft. Crafted items can have equal power to loot you find in the rest of the game. They're not any lesser. They're just a bit more random in what stat levels they'll drop with. So use crafting as needed. Another important feature to be aware of is exotic reconfiguration. Now you probably aren't going to use this for a little while into your Division 2 journey, but it's still good to know about it, and it's much less talked about than many of the other features, so I definitely wanted to highlight it. You might have heard me mention a minute ago that the only category of item excluded from recalibration are exotics, and that's because they all come with fixed stats, meaning every coyote's mask exotic will have the same attributes, etc. However, you do have one tool to try and improve any stats on your item that you may have, and that is via reconfiguration. So for this, you're first going to need to have an exotic that you want to reconfigure. Then you're going to want to go to Anaya, the NPC that sits by the crafting bench inside the White House. You're going to find that she has a blueprint for sale that's labeled as a reconfiguration for whatever exotic you own. Buy that and then go right next to you to the crafting bench. From there, go to whichever category of item the exotic is under, whether it's a weapon, mask, knee pad, whatever, you're going to then tap all the way down to the bottom node on the left hand side. This is where the exotics are at for each category. Find the blueprint for the one that you have and there you go. You can donate the one that you currently have in order to reconfigure it. What this will do is destroy the one you own and give you a brand new one with totally random stats. So it's important to note that this is not a guaranteed upgrade. I could have halfway rolls on every slot, reconfigure an exotic, and it comes out the other side with quarter rolls on every slot. So it's not a guarantee, but it is your one and only option to just re-roll the whole thing and try to get better rolls so that is exotic reconfiguration. Next thing to talk about is starting to get on the fringe of stuff that you really won't need to worry about for a good while into the end game but again it's still good to be aware of and that is optimization. If you go back over to the recalibration bench you'll see the optimization tab. The name makes it pretty self-explanatory this allows you to optimize your gear items. All you have to do for this is pick out which item you want to optimize by going to the correct tab and scrolling through then you choose which individual stat you want to work on optimizing. You cannot do it for them all at once. And then optimize to your delight. This system is notoriously expensive. It costs a lot to max out even one stat roll and it uses its own currency system. So you will be farming for a while before you can really interact with this much, but it can certainly be valuable to be able to just bump up that last stat you were needing to max out on an item. All right. And then we finally come to our last end game feature to be aware of, and that is expertise. Now I'll just be straight up with you. You do not need to worry about this system. When you're first starting off in the end game, you're going to want to build up a currency and resource space by selling 
recalling and deconstructing unwanted gear, and that's when you're not donating stuff to the recalibration library. The expertise system requires a lot of donation, a lot of direct dedication to leveling it up. It is certainly important. It essentially acts as an SHD watch system for your weapons and gear, allowing you to upgrade them beyond their maximum power. But it is absolutely a later on in game feature to interact with. I would break it all down here. However, it's actually kind of complex and there's a lot to explain quickly. So once more, I will leave a link in the description to a dedicated video I did breaking that system down. So when you get to the point in the end game where you're ready to tackle the system, come back to this video and find that link or search it up and you should find it pretty easily and worry about it then. But for now, just focus on the other stuff that we already covered. Okay, folks, those are all of the major endgame pieces of content and features that you need to be aware of in The Division 2. Do you feel more prepared to take on the endgame? You're probably thinking, no, because you still haven't told me what I should be doing, what I should go play, and, well, that's kind of the beauty of it, my friends. As I said earlier on, The Division 2's endgame is incredibly horizontal. Everything is open to you. You just have to figure out what your goals are and how you want to achieve them. Do you want to make a super solid build right off the bat? Maybe you go do Countdown and get lots of loot. Do you want to explore the world a bit? Maybe you tune your world difficulty and go run some control points. Do you want a PvP? You should probably get a build first. <laughs> I will also leave a link to my beginner's PvP guide below, but the bottom line is, I can't and don't really want to tell you what to go do, because there's a lot of content to choose from and it's all worthwhile and valuable in its own right. Bounties, control points, missions, game modes, raids, they all offer their own unique experiences, but very little in this game is locked to specific activities or content. Some is, but the majority is not, so all I can recommend is that you take the knowledge you learned in this video, come up with a basic goal of what you want to start doing and go for it. See where it takes you. Maybe you'll get an item that you weren't looking for, but it inspires you to make a particular build. Maybe you end up doing a piece of content you really like, so you do more of that. Wherever your path leads, I hope this guide helped you become more acclimated and prepared for The Division 2 and its endgame, and I very much hope you enjoy it. Thank you all so much for watching. Leave a like if you enjoyed this video and be sure to subscribe with notifications on so you can be updated every time I upload. Let me know your thoughts on this new player guide, my friends. If you are new to the game, was it helpful? Was it not? If you're a veteran around here, are there any words of advice you would pass along that I didn't cover? As I said at the start, if you have any questions whatsoever now or in the future, please feel free to ask away in the comments and I will be curious to hear everybody's thoughts. That's going to do it for me today, folks. Enjoy your journey through The Division 2. Once again, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day and until the next one guys, Rogue Gold.